Good afternoon. I am Harry Poston, Chairman of the American Statistical Association's Committee for the Filming of Distinguished Statisticians. It is my privilege to welcome you to the ninth Pfizer Colloquium of the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut. The purpose of these colloquia is to bring to Connecticut the most distinguished scientists in the field of statistics. Because of the importance of this colloquium, we are videotaping it for the videotape archives of the American Statistical Association. We are grateful to Pfizer Central Research for the support of these colloquia and the support of this videotaping. To introduce our distinguished speaker, I will now call upon my colleague, Nidis Bukopadye. Thank you, Harry. <clears throat> Professor Herman Chernoff is our speaker for the ninth Pfizer Colloquium. Dr. Chernoff is currently a professor in the Department of Statistics at Harvard University, and he was previously uh, had uh, faculty positions at the University of Illinois at Stanford and at MIT. He has also served as visiting professor in various centers of learning uh, overseas and uh, in, in, in this country. Dr. Chernoff's honors are too numerous to detail, and so I will point out only a very few. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the International Statistical Institute. He is also a past president of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics and a, an elected fellow of the same institute as well as the American Statistical Association. A first stripped volume entitled Recent Advances in Statistics, papers in honor of Herman Chernoff on his 60th birthday was presented to him on behalf of his friends and colleagues from uh, all over the world. <clears throat> In 1987, Dr. Chernoff received the prestigious S.S. Wilkes Memorial Medal and was cited for his outstanding research in large sample theory and sequential analysis. His extensive service to scholarly societies and on government panels, his effectiveness and popularity as a teacher, and his continuing impact on the theory of statistics and its applications as well. Dr. Chernoff's publications include two monographs and over 100 papers in both theory as well as applications, and many results of his research are now considered classics. His 1958 annals paper with Richard Savage, the 1959 annals paper on sequential design of experiments, and the 1967 Berkeley Symposium paper on sequential models for clinical trials, among many others, fall into this category of classics. <coughs> He also authored the paper in the 1973 issue of the Journal of the American Statistical Association creating the now famous Chernoff Faces. We are truly honored to have Dr. Chernoff here today to speak to us. The title of his talk is The History of Sequential Analysis, Some Reminiscences. Professor Chernoff. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to be selected as the ninth Pfizer Colloquium speaker and to revisit the Storrs campus of the University of Connecticut. The topic I selected is some history of sequential analysis, and when I started to prepare this lecture, I soon realized that it was presumptuous to attempt anything representing a uh, decently complete overview in the limited time allotted. So uh, naturally, I'll confine myself to emphasizing areas in which I was most interested and in which I made some contributions, thereby presenting a somewhat distorted picture of a field of great theoretical and philosophical importance and the practical implications of which have barely been exploited. Uh, some scientific advances seem so natural that it's difficult to understand why they weren't uh, perceived much sooner. Uh, Neyman Pearson uh, theory and hypothesis testing is one such example, and the basic of concept of sequential analysis is another. That concept is that it pays to study the results of some experimental data before deciding whether to continue gathering data or to stop and to make a terminal decision. The fundamental barrier was one of statistical dogma which made it much more difficult for a statistician to propose such an approach than for a reasonably clever layperson or scientist untrained in statistics. One consequence of professional training is that one learns of circumstances where a layperson would regard as common sense, where what a layperson would regard as common sense, is incorrect. Uh, typically, the professional develops an enhanced concept of common sense 
but has to warn others to avoid certain situations. For example, probability theory is full of apparent paradoxes which amaze and confuse beginners. The statistical analysis is so treacherous to the lay person that the book on how to lie with statistics became a popular text. And to avoid such difficulties, we, we constantly warn others, and sometimes ourselves, about certain things one dare not do. And one of these dogmas was never look at the data before deciding on how to analyze them. And this is certainly a sound dogma, but it has to be uh, understood, and it can and should be violated when appropriate, but with great care. Data dredging is a violation which can lead to all sorts of erroneous conclusions. On the other hand, exploratory data analysis, as introduced by Tukey, would not be viable unless the dogma were violated by investigators who are sensitive to the dangers involved. Without such violations, we, present, we prevent ourselves from letting the data tell us anything that we did not anticipate beforehand. In his book, Sequential Analysis, a world states that the problem of sequential analysis arose in the statistical research group at Columbia University, which operated during World War II under a contract with the Office of Scientific Research and Development. Comments made by Captain Schuyler of the Bureau of Ordnance of the Department of Navy spurred Milton Friedman, who later became a Nobel laureate in economics, and W. Allen Wallace to recognize the potentialities of sequential analysis. They conjectured that sequential tests would lead to improvements over conventional fixed sample size tests, and they obtained some examples of improvement. At this stage, they proposed the problem of sequential testing to Abraham Wald. Now, it's widely understood that as long as the strategy for dealing with data is established before seeing the data, there really is no violation of the dogma in letting the data determine when to stop experimentation. I don't know how long and how hard it was to persuade the various actors in this chain to move. But once the notion of sequential inference was presented to and accepted by Abraham Wald, he conceived and developed the sequential probability ratio test almost overnight in a spectacular burst of effort in 1943. There was an apocryphal story that went about, and it's undoubtedly false, that because sequential analysis was a military secret, and Wald, an Austrian national, was an enemy alien, the security office stood by his desk and snatched each page as he wrote it from him so he wouldn't have access to this classified material. As is often the case with really good ideas, there were earlier versions where these were proposed. Dodger Romick in 1929 proposed the use of double sampling in sampling inspection. In fact, the Schuhart concept of quality control is basically a lightly disguised version of sequential inference that did not fit into classical forms of estimation and testing. In 1940, Mahala Nobis directed a series of censuses of uh, jute in Bengal. These censuses were of increasing size and they were taken in order to obtain preliminary information about the parameters involved and were used to design the final sample. In response to a desire to estimate a small binomial parameter p with standard deviation proportional to p, Haldane and Tweedy in 1945 suggested counting the number of trials until a specified number of successes occurred. This use of the negative binomial was a special case of sequential inference, but one which did not seem to confront the dogma problem directly. In fact, as Barnard pointed out, it's closely related to the scoring system in tennis and ping pong, where, uh, and some other sports. In these, one announces a winner when one contestant scores a given number of successes. However, if that point is reached while the opponent is close by, the announcement is deferred until the successes of one player exceeds that of the other by at least two. In fact, uh, this additional proviso helps considerably 
in the efficient determination of which of two closely matched players is better. Another predecessor was a physicist, Barkey, who proposed a multiple sampling scheme in 1943. During World War II, Barnard in England developed a sequential method applied to double dichotomies. He did so independently of Wald, but later became aware of the American effort, although communications were severely limited by wartime conditions. It's my understanding that one factor that slowed his progress was that he was then a beginner in statistics, as are many of today's old timers, as were many of today's old timers, and he wasn't aware of the prominence of the likelihood ratio in the Neyman Pearson theory at that time. In 1947, Wald published the book Sequential Analysis, which was directed mainly at a relatively unsophisticated audience. The book was very well written and quite remarkable. It laid out the major results till that time so that they could be easily applied. And the proofs and the more complex results were displayed in the appendix and that appendix I still find interesting to read from t time to time, uh, somehow getting slightly new insights each time. Interestingly enough, the derivation of the proposal to use the sequential probability ratio test seemed to rely on the implicit use of a Bayesian approach. At that time, Wald was definitely not a Bayesian. He I believe they accepted the dogma that Bayesian inference, being subjective, was wrong. On the other hand, he had proved the complete class theory, theorem in decision theory, suggesting that all admissible decision procedures were Bayes strategies, or limits of Bayes strategies, so he was perfectly prepared to use the Bayesian calculus as a mathematical artifact, even though he did not believe in it as a principle of inference. But in 1947, there were two major gaps in the theory. The attack on testing composite hypotheses was vague, and Wald had good reason to feel that the sequential probability ratio test was at least close to optimal, but the conjecture of the optimality of the sequential probability ratio test for testing, a simple hypothesis versus a simple alternative with linear cost of sampling, was unproven. I'm reading most of this uh, talk, but I think I'll uh, defer for a minute to recall that in 1946, uh, there was a uh, meeting uh, that was held, a summer session at the University of North Carolina. At that time, uh, uh, the University of North Carolina was opening up their statistics program and the Research Triangle program under uh, the uh, 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 directorship of Gertrude Cox, and during that summer they had a session of about six weeks in which they invited many statisticians from all over the country to attend, and some courses were given. Uh, I actually attended courses by Cochran, R.A. Fisher, and Wolfowitz at that time, and that was the time when I had first decided to go into the field of statistics, and I had occasion to meet the uh, establishment people whom I had only heard of before, and also met a number of people who have since become uh, quite well known in the field. Uh, Herb Solomon, uh, Al Bowker, Ted Harris, Milton Sobel, Kiefitz, Bert Gottfried Nerva, uh, Lionel Weiss, R.L. Anderson, were all there. And uh, since I neglected to take the advice of Harry Poston to throw some jokes in, I thought I would at least tell some reminiscences Says, and one of these is that during these sessions, I used to see R.A. Fisher swimming in the pool naked, but he had a beard at that time, and that was rather unusual in this country in the, in the 40s. And he would swim with his beard and a pipe, smoking a pipe, floating on his back uh, and his beard. And that was sort of a remarkable thing for a young statistician or prospective statistician to see at that time. <laughs> now, the reason for this digression was at that time, uh, I was taking this course from Wolfowitz in sequential analysis, and I was interested in the optimality question, and it seemed to me that I could evaluate the operating characteristic of the sequential probability ratio test using uh, an integral equation approach, 
And, and I, I wrote something up and gave it to Wolfowitz to review because it seemed clear to me if that my approach was right, we could disprove the optimality very easily. And uh, he looked at it and he seemed to t accept it as that was okay. But I was a little puzzled that he was willing at this time to essentially forego the possibility of optimality without being much more critical. And I myself was a little worried about some of the steps in this uh, proof, and I pointed them out to him. And this aroused him to take a little more interest in what was going on, and uh, he, he reviewed the thing, and, I, uh, and he managed to save the possibility of the optimality, optimality of the sequential probability ratio test and destroy my instant doctorate all at the same time. Um, However, uh, in 1947, it hadn't yet been proved, but in 1948, uh, shortly before Wald's death in an, in an airplane accident in India, Wald and Wolfowitz finally derived uh, the optimality with a proof which was subject to some criticism. The main idea of the proof was to show that the sequential probability ratio test is a Bayes solution to a sequence of uh, sequential decision problems. This optimality is very remarkable. It states that if the sequential probability ratio test has error probabilities alpha and beta under the two hypotheses, then the expected sample sizes under these two hypotheses are less than those of any other test which has error probabilities no larger than alpha and beta. So we're simultaneously minimizing two expected sample sizes uh, with, uh, with this test. And this property of simultaneously minimizing two things seemed extremely uh, strange. The world Wolfowitz proof somehow, uh, or somehow had some flaws. The basic idea uh, was sound, but the approach was seen to have a major, major theoretic uh, flaw by Arrow, Blackwell, and Gershik, who were at the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica when Walt presented a version of his proof. And they collaborated on an alternative derivation. And that was a great summer for Kenneth Arrow. He also, in that summer, derived his results on the impossibility theorem for social welfare function. And that became the basis of his doctoral dissertation and uh, contributed considerably to his receiving the Nobel Award in Economics. And it seems that uh, it, it's nice to know that uh, statisticians can't get Nobel laureates as, as mathematicians, but uh, as economists, they may be able to do it. I, I believe that uh, Walden Wolfowitz are very unhappy with the fact that Arrow, Blackwell, and Gershik had capitalized on their main idea. Uh, Wolf, uh, Wolfowitz criticized the paper they published for a gap that it had. However, the alternative proof that they presented had several serious, uh, great advantages. The Wald Wolfowitz paper had several problems which uh, Wolfowitz supposedly corrected in 1966 in a paper which is extremely convoluted, if correct. On the other hand, the Arrow Blackwell Gershik paper involves a non trivial application of the simple idea of backward induction which uh, provided the inspiration for Bellman to develop dynamic programming. Uh, Blackwell and I uh, regard dynamic programming as a special case of sequential analysis, but I think that Bellman must have had the reverse opinion. The backward induction argument was complicated by the fact that the sequential analysis problem is open-ended with an infinite horizon. And they treated it as the limit of a sequence of problems truncated at finite but successively longer horizons. As the horizon grows, the statistician has more options and his expected loss decreases. The resulting monotonicity considerations resolved the potential measure theoretic problems and made it easy to show that the Bayes strategy is a sequential probability ratio test. And their argument easily extends to any finite number of alternative possible terminal decisions. The flaw that Wolfowitz criticized in this paper was that having proved that the Bayes strategies are sequential probability ratio tests, they took for granted but failed to prove rigorously uh, 
that one can find a sequence of Bayes problems for a given sequential probability ratio test, where in this sequence where the probability, uh, the prior probabilities approach zero or one. This step was needed to establish the minimum property of the expected sample size under each hypothesis. Continuity and dimensionality considerations made this uh, assumption quite plausible, but a formal proof by Mathis did not appear until 1963. On the other hand, the Walden Wolfowitz paper might have been used as a reference for this point. In the meantime, between 1945 and the middle 1950s, the concept of sequential inference, either directly or indirectly, had a liberating influence on statistical thought, which gave rise to new and novel formulations which had considerable influence. The Robbins-Monroe method of stochastic approximation was remarkable in the efficiency of its attack on estimating where a regression function attains a given value. This method is an early but restrained example of sequential design of experiments. After each observation, an estimate of the desired value is obtained, and that's used as the next value of x at which the dependent variable y is observed. And here, the current estimate simultaneously serves two purposes. It's an estimate, is one purpose, and the second is that it's the choice of the next experiment. This method had several interesting properties. First, it is recursive, and each estimate depends only on the preceding estimate and the latest observation, and thus the data storage needs are reduced. Second, the procedure depends very little on the precise nature of the regression function. And finally, the method has some ability to track the solution. If the regression function changes in time, this method will sort of follow the solution, although that property was not analyzed at the time. Another uh, direction was dynamic programming. That was developed by Bellman, and it itself is so large a subject that I won't expand on it, except for the field of Markov decision function, uh, problems. Derman in 1970 traces this field back to a paper by Shapley in 1953 on stochastic games, but some in initial innovations due to Lieberman and Solomon in 1956 introduced this paradigm in an attack on the problem of continuous sampling inspection, where the rate of inspection is allowed to depend on the recent past history. In the early 1950s, the two-on-bandit problem was introduced in the paper by Robbins as an approach to the problem of sequential experimentation. Up to this time, this more general view of sequential inference was neglected in formal research, which was directed at independent, identically distributed observations. The main issue had been when to stop sampling. Stochastic approximation had been only a small step in the more general direction of not only deciding whether to stop experimentation, but also of deciding which experiment to perform next if continuation is called for. From a theoretical and philosophical point of view, this extension was important. Scientific research is generally carried out, consists of performing experiments which yield information which lend clarity and permits the scientist to refine his theories and simultaneously to sharpen his experiments. A theory which attacks the issue of sequential experimentation may give insights of a potential wide generality. The original Tuan Bandit problem failed to serve as a prototype example, but it aroused a great deal of interest, and spin-offs had substantial impact. There were lots of mathematicians at that time who took hours off to try to solve this problem, but the combinatoric aspects of it seemed extremely formidable, and it was very difficult for anybody to go beyond three steps backward in the, uh, in the, in the backward induction argument. Uh, let me explain what the two-arm bandit problem is. That's a problem where a player is allowed to make n selections in sequence from two arms. Each arm has an associated probability of yielding a win. Uh, 
the player's object is to maximize the expected number of wins. To simplify matters, it's assumed that the two probabilities, P1 and P2, uh, are known, but it's not known which arm is associated with the larger probability. It's also assumed that the asso arm associated with the larger probability is selected by some random device with probability a half. The natural conjecture in this game is that it is best to select the favorable arm. That is the arm for which the posterior probability that it has the larger probability is greater than a half. However, a question arises. Could it be that sometimes we could gain more information by selecting what seems to be the less favorable arm, so much so that it would compensate in the long run for the expected loss in not pursuing the arm which now seems more favorable? In the special case where the two probabilities add to one, the answer to these questions is no. So then a win with arm one and a loss with arm two are equally probable and yield effectively the same information. The natural conjecture is that for all P1 and P2, one should always pull the arm that seems more favorable. If that conjecture is true, though, then you're not really learning anything about experimental design. You're just proceeding in such a way as to maximize your expectation on the next step. And uh, it proved surprisingly difficult to prove this conjecture. Uh, and it was finally established in 1957 by Feldman, who was a student of Blackwell, in a two-stage argument. The proof did not completely wipe out the problem. As stated, the problem involved a strange prior probability distribution. If we identify the arms as A and B, and A has probably P sub A, and B has probably P sub B, then the prior probability distribution assigns probably a half to the point where P sub A, P sub B is equal to P1, P2, and probably a half to the point where P sub A, P sub B is equal to P sub 2, P sub 1. And that's the sort of an unusual probability distribution. If, however, we apply the prior distribution where P sub A and P sub B were independent, the problem would once more raise the issue of trading information for immediate gain. After Feldman's result, the two-arm bandit problem remained relatively quiescent until the middle 70s. At that time, Gittins introduced the Gittins index to handle the multi-arm bandit problem when there is a discount factor and an infinite horizon of pulls. We mentioned that in a manner of speaking, Schuhat's quality control was an example of sequential inference. It could be regarded as an informal attack on a Markov decision problem. In 1953, E.S. Page introduced the Q sub method, which used an overtly sequential approach to the problem of quickly detecting shifts in behavior. This approach represented a major innovation, although it appeared on the surface as an ad hoc attack on the problem. It's remarkably efficient for many models related to its function of quick detection. It has a natural uh, graphical interpretation which is simple to apply. The Q sum chart tells a very convincing story that doesn't require a sophisticated observer to interpret. I personally believe that its value as a graphical device outweighs its very considerable value as a more sophisticated analytical tool of inference or decision making. The potential value Q sum charts in quality control and brings up a puzzling problem in American industry. While sequential analysis was developed to cope with important industrial problems uh, connected with the war effort, American industry tended on the whole to neglect this field after the war. In fact, American industry has neglected statistics in general and quality control in particular. The task of industrial quality control where it was practiced was delegated largely to engineers with minimal understanding of statistical concepts. How this came about isn't clear to me, but while the practice of statistical quality control flourished in Japan under the inspiration of Deming, it tended to stagnate in the United States until recently. At this point, let me digress on the issue of optimality. In 
For mathematicians, optimality is an object of interest in itself. For applied statisticians, that's a secondary value. What's of much greater concern is how much of the data are being effectively wasted or lost by using a current procedure. If one can show that the loss is effectively 4% using a reasonably practical and robust procedure, as is the case in the use of the Mann-Whitney test, then one may be content. But to show this, one must know what is a reasonable limit to what may be attained. The Cromer rao theorem furnishes an upper bound of what may be attainable in estimation. And the asymptotic optimality, the maximum likelihood estimate, tells us that that bound may be attained. And uh, it also hints at what constitutes a reasonable procedure which may be almost optimal under ideal conditions and robust under more general circumstances and practical to implement. Another point for seeking optimization is that methods which seem reasonably good under circumstances which are typical today may be very poor for circumstances, for example, values of the parameter of the problem, which change drastically. Thus, a good procedure for estimating a binomial uh, parameter P for P between 0.2 and 0.8 may be inappropriate for dealing with values of P about 10 to the minus 3. Hence, the applied statistician shouldn't sneer at the theoretician searching for optimality. There's another exercise in optimality for which I have uh, somewhat less appreciation, although this too has some potential use. And that is, uh, given the statistical procedure, to inquire for the problem for which that procedure is optimum. Occasionally, some useful insights may, derive, may be derived from such an exercise. In any case, it's uh, my opinion uh, that most statistical applications require little more than a modicum of common sense. But what constitutes common sense as statisticians know it is surprisingly rare among uh, people untrained in statistics. And the function of statistical theory is to develop and enhance what we think of as common sense. Optimality plays an important role in this direction. And one of R.A. Fisher's most important contributions was to see before decision theory made it clear that optimality considerations in statistics would force us to look at large sample or asymptotic theory. For small samples, decision theory tells us that there are many admissible procedures among which it is difficult to choose without becoming confirmed Bayesians or succumbing to some comparable religion, it's difficult to define what is optimal. However, for large samples, the effect of the prior distribution generally becomes negligible, and the Bayes strategies tend to converge to a common asymptotically optimal procedure. Another interesting development of the early 1950s was the introduction of large sample theory into sequential analysis. In a tour de force, Enscombe examined sequential estimation from an asymptotic point of view and demonstrated that for the sequential estimation with specified accuracy of the mean of a normal distribution with unknown variance, the slight modification of a simple-minded rule leads to a loss of efficiency, which is the equivalent of employing at most two extra observations. Whereas the error in estimate is of the order of magnitude of the square root of the number of observations, this, a second order result, demonstrates that the cost of ignorance of the nuisance parameter is not only comparatively slight, but it's remarkably small. In summarizing this paper, Enscombe indicated considerable doubt about the potential for practical applications of his result. His fears for this paper, and indeed for sequential analysis in general, seem to have been uh, well justified. There's been remarkably little application of the formal theory, and part of the reason is practical difficulty of implementation. Part of it has been ignorance. I've on occasion come across experimenters who were intrigued and delighted to hear for the first time of the possibility of sequential inference. And so the difficulty of implementation, that should be less of an obstacle in our computer age if appropriate software packages become available.
Another difficulty is interpretation, and it's important to develop a language with which experimenters could be educated in the potentials of this method and its proper interpretation. And here again, I think that creative software may prove very helpful. To return to large sample theory and sequential analysis, I became interested in that area in the early 50s. In 1951, on a visit to Stanford University, I'd been presented with a classification problem which reduced to a fixed sample size test of a simple hypothesis versus a simple alternative, where the test statistic was constrained to be of a very special form because of practical considerations. The test statistic had to be a sum of IID random variables. An example of such a problem would be to test whether the mean of a normal distribution with a known variance was plus one or minus one based on the sum of yi, where the yi assumed the values zero, one, or two, depending on the value of the observed random variable xi. Now, I was permitted to decide which values of x deserve to be given y values of zero, one, or two. One possible application of this would be in sampling inspection, where instead of directly measuring the objects, one uses a screening device to categorize them. The restriction on using sums this seems a bit artificial without assuming that the users were incapable of doing advanced arithmetic. On the surface, this was a very special problem in the design of experiments. The allocation of y values corresponds to the design of the mesh size in the screen. And after confronting the design aspect, it was necessary to evaluate the error probabilities. There I found to my surprise that the central limit theorem was not applicable. To separate the two hypotheses by an appropriate threshold on the test statistic meant to apply the central limit theorem in a region which was the square root of n standard deviations away from the mean. Here the theorem simply states that this probability approaches zero, but does not give a reasonable estimate of how fast it does so. This required the use of large deviation theory, which Cormier had introduced in 1938. And that theory not only re resolved this specific problem that I had, but was it applicable to the Neyman-Pearson likelihood ratio test for the simple hypothesis versus simple alternative, since the logarithm of the likelihood ratio is the sum of IID, that's independent identically distributed random variables. What I found very surprising is that apparently no one had previously investigated the large sample properties of the likelihood ratio test for this easiest of all possible testing problems using the ancient tools of Neyman and Pearson. For those who study the effect of age on perception of time, it will be no surprise that in 1951, I regard the Neyman Pearson theory as ancient, whereas I just completed a draft of a manuscript entitled on the likelihood ratio number two. That's a sequel to my recent paper on the likelihood ratio in 1954. One consequence of the application of large deviation theory was that the Kullback Leibniz information number could be interpreted as the exponential rate at which one error probability approaches zero as n approaches infinity while the other error probability is kept fixed. Also, we could find asymptotic measures of efficiency which could be used to evaluate both tests and experimental designs. For me, there was another consequence. If the Neyman-Pearson theory had not been mined for results so close to the surface, it was likely that the same could be said for the Walt sequential probability ratio test. And indeed, a superficial asymptotic analysis of the sequential probability ratio test revealed that the optimal Bayes procedure assigned most of its cost to sampling, and that that cost was asymptotically inversely proportional to the kullback leibler information number. Another consequence was that for large samples, the effective reduction in cost was a factor of four, and not the two that appeared in the literature. And this discrepancy is largely due to the fact, for the factor of four to become a reasonable approximation, the sample size has to be large enough 
for very small error probabilities, whereas sample sizes which yielded error probabilities of about 1% were not sufficiently large to make this factor a good approximation. Nevertheless, the theory pointed out the importance of the callback libel information as a measure for experimental design. One may wonder how one can deal with large sample theory in sequential analysis, the major objective of which is to reduce sample size, and for which the sample size is random variable not to be specified in advance. My resolution of that was simply to let the cost C per observation approach zero. Then the appropriate sample size increases. In fact, the simple analysis referred to before yields that the expected sample size is proportional to log C inverse, where C is the cost of sampling, and inversely proportional to the callback libel information. On the other hand, the error probability is of the order of C, and is achievable by stopping when the posterior probability of one of the alternatives goes below some multiple of C. Uh, thus, the cost of sampling is of the order of C log C inverse, which is a larger order of magnitude than the cost of error, which is of the order of C. And the ratio of these two costs is of the order of log C inverse, which grows very slowly with C inverse. And this explains in part why very small error probabilities are required for some of the asymptotic approximations to be good. These asymptotic results propelled me in the late 50s to pursue the asymptotic theory of sequential design of experiments for testing hypotheses. It seemed clear that the first order results for sequential estimation would not require anything sophisticated or yield anything surprising. But design for sequentially testing possibly composite hypotheses seemed a more challenging project and one which had theoretical, philosophical, and potentially practical implications. It had been clear from the earliest days of sequential analysis that the sequential choice of experiments was a natural error, uh, area to explore, but backward induction arguments had proved formidable and no real progress had been made. I'd worked on optimal design for fixed large sample size problems in both testing and estimation, it was natural to explore sequential experimentation asymptotically. Moreover, my asymptotic sequential approach somehow managed to use the optimality of a world sequential probability ratio test to bypass the need to apply backward induction. The role of the callback libel information was clearly primary. However, the callback libel information number for discriminating between two possible values of the parameter, mu1 and mu2, is not symmetric. If we knew that mu1 were the true value of the parameter, it would pay to select an experiment to maximize the information from mu1 to mu2. Otherwise, we would wish to maximize the information from mu2 to mu1. For the sequential experimenter, the resolution of this dilemma is simple. If the evidence to, da to date favors mu1, select the next experiment to maximize the information from mu1 to mu2. Otherwise, maximize the information from mu2 to mu1. The choice becomes less trivial when dealing with composite hypotheses. If our current data suggests that mu1 is the true value of the parameter, and the alternative hypothesis is that the true value is either mu2 or mu3, then analysis shows that one ought to select the next experiment to, min uh, to maximize the minimum of the information from mu1 to mu2 and the information from mu1 to mu3. And this suggests that we look upon information as an asymmetric measure of distance between distributions and extend that measure to sets of distributions. Thus, we can define the uh, callback libel measure from mu1 to a set of values to be the minimum of that measure from mu1 to each of the points in the set. And when our current estimate mu is mu1, we select our next experiment to maximize the callback libel measure from mu1 to the set of points in the parameter space corresponding to the alternative to the one in which mu1 is. Applying that principle can be proved to lead to asymptotically optimal results. It gives rise, though, to a partial paradox. The minimax nature of the method may call for a randomized experiment at each stage. 
But optimality was approached from a Bayesian point of view and should not require randomization. One way to resolve this paradox is that if the next experiment is a mixture of two, each with probability a half, one could equally well, from an asymptotic point of view, carry out each of these experiments for the next two observations. Thus, the randomization is not essential, but simply a device to see to it that each of the experiments is performed about equally often until accumulated data tell the experiment that this original estimate of mu was seriously wrong or that it's time to stop accumulating data. A second point of interest is that since asymptotic optimality is mathematically considerably weaker than optimality, establishing it does not require backward induction. One way to look at this phenomenon is the following. Let one consider a sequential procedure which should last about a week, but might last a year. Suppose that we're told that the problem has then changed. If the process lasts a year, the payoff or the loss will change substantially, but relatively little compared to the cost of sampling for the whole year. Then it's very unlikely that this change of the problem will have much effect on the nature of our inferences in the first few weeks. If, however, the payoff changes very enormously, uh, then it would have, one would have to pay serious attention to those changes. From this point of view, it's not surprising that backward induction could be avoided in obtaining approximate optimality for many problems of the sort that statisticians deal with. My work on sequential design for testing applied to the case of a finite number of possible states, values of the parameter, and a finite number of possible experiments. My students, Bessler and Albert, extended these results to accommodate k actions, that's k possible hypotheses, infinitely many possible experiments, and infinitely many possible states of nature. Our last result required that the hypothesis spaces be separated in the sense that the callback libel distance from one hypothesis to another should be bounded away from zero. This condition is violated in one of the simpler composite problems, that of testing whether the mean of a normal distribution is positive or negative. That problem doesn't even involve a choice of experiment. At this point, it seemed important to understand the sequential problem of testing composite hypotheses better without the experimental choice issue. For practical application, Wall's first approach to composite hypotheses was to use indifference zones to test whether the mean is positive or negative, determine two numbers, mu1 and mu2, so if the true mean is less than mu1, you're anxious to decide negative. If the mean is greater than mu2, you're anxious to decide positive. If mu is between mu1 and mu2, then the loss involved in making the wrong decision is not great, and then act as though you're testing the simple hypothesis mu equal mu1 versus the simple alternative mu equal mu2. This approach applied in a reasonable fashion was satisfactory for most applications, but failed to address the theoretical issues. Moreover, it provided a test for which the expected sample size was greatest in exactly those cases which were of least concern. That is, when mu was close to zero, in that case, asymptotic analysis indicated that the expected sample size was larger by an order of magnitude when mu is equal to zero than for mu removed from zero. Kiefer and Weiss approached this problem as a three-state problem. They added to mu1 and mu2 a third state mu naught, and then they posed the uh, problem and characterized the solution of the problem of minimizing expected sample size when mu is equal to mu naught for specified error probabilities at mu1 and mu2. This formulation, though, doesn't fit into any sensible decision theoretic framework. So I asked uh, Gideon Schwartz to examine the three-state problem using costs of sampling and costs of wrong terminal decisions when mu is equal to mu1 and when mu is equal to mu2, but no cost for either decision when mu is equal to mu0. In response to this, he was able to show that the normalized shape of the optimal Bayes stopping boundary 
converge to a pentagon independent of the non-degenerate prior distribution. He then extended his results to deal with the infinite state case where there was no cost for terminal decisions when mu was in an indifference zone between uh, mu1 and mu2. Here the optimal shape in the normal distribution problem was represented by a pair of tilted parabolas. Kiefer and Sachs subsequently unified these results of Albert, Bessler, and Schwartz. The fact that a Schwartz result required an indifference zone left me unsatisfied, and I decided to attack the natural problem of testing whether the mean of a normal distribution with no variance is positive or negative, where the loss for the wrong decision is the absolute value of mu. In other words, the loss may be small, but it's not zero. If the true mean is close to zero, the asymptotic approach suggested that the problem could be approximated by a continuous time version where one observed, instead of the sequence of sums of normal random variables, Brownian motion with unknown drift mu per unit time, and then has to decide whether the drift is positive or negative. The original problem could be regarded as a variation of the continuous time problem, where stopping was restricted to a discrete set of possible times. The advantage of this formulation is that it can be reduced to the solution of a problem in differential equations, and that is a free boundary problem involving the heat equation. Having carried out this reduction, I approached some mathematicians for the solution and received some vague comments about integral equations. In fact, there is a classical Stefan problem, which is a free boundary problem involving the heat equation, which applies to the behavior of melting ice. And that problem is basically more difficult than that from our statistical problem, which derives some inner stability from the optimization nature of the problem. Without the benefit of the solution of free boundary problem, relatively crude statistical considerations led to conjecture on the nature of the stopping rule in early sampling. And then in a series of four papers, one co-authored by John Breakwell, I attacked this problem and obtained characteristics of the solution, an approximation to the solution, asymptotic expansions, and the relationship between a discrete and continuous time version, which enhanced the accuracy of the numerical approximations. While working on this topic while on sabbatical in England, I was invited to give a lecture at Cambridge, and there I was introduced to John Bather, a graduate student who had just succeeded in deriving both inner and outer bounds to the solution. Uh, one approach that he used with great skill was that of generating classes of solutions of the heat equation and finding decision problems for which these solutions represented the optimal solution. And then by relating these problems to the original sequential problem, he was able to obtain these inner and outer bounds. I also met Champanen, who informed me that he and Turing had worked on this topic years ago, and Champanen had published a paper indicating that they, that they had derived an approximation corresponding to the period where sampling had been going on for a long time. And that indication lacked detail, but the results seemed sound. The techniques and approaches of this work was also applicable to a problem that I later referred to as the one-on banded problem. Given a one-on banded, which may or may, may not favor the customer who's allowed to play at most n times, when should he quit? If that banded is favorable, he doesn't want to quit until he's forced to at time n. If it is unfavorable, he doesn't want to start up. He should start playing and quit when he's sufficiently convinced that the game is unfavorable. That depends on the evidence he collects and his prior probabilities. It pays for him to keep trying, even when the indications are negative, if there's a reasonable possibility that the bandit is favorable and there remains a long horizon of plays so that the bandit would pay off handsomely. That problem was at the heart of work done with S.N. Ray on rectified sampling inspection and on clinical trials. That result could be phrased in terms of a nominal significance level at which stopping takes place. At any time, that level depends on the ratio of the amount of information that has been gathered to the total information that will ultimately be available at time n. When that proportion is small, 
the critical nominal significance level is approximately twice the ratio. Thus, if one starts with a vague prior and a horizon of 10,000, the critical nominal significance level after 100 observations would be about 0.02. That work had been anticipated by Inscombe in several papers where surprisingly good approximations to optimality for related problems had been derived without the benefit of elaborate machinery of the free boundary problem. Uh, time now to bring our ninth, collo uh, ninth Pfizer colloquium to a conclusion, but before we do, I'd like to thank our speaker. This, this, concludes, this concludes our ninth Pfizer colloquium.